Item number, SCP-040. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-040 is to be contained in a standard humanoid containment module within Bioresearch Area 12. The chamber is to be connected to an airborne tranquilizer dispersal system to be activated in the event of SCP-040 manifesting its properties outside of testing environments. The chamber is to be observed by two supervisory personnel at all times. Recreational items such as toys, games, and art supplies may be provided to SCP-040 at the discretion of supervisory personnel. As they have been determined to pose no possible threat, SCP-040-1A, SCP-040-1C, and SCP-040-1J have been approved to remain in the containment chamber with SCP-040 for purposes of the subject's mental well-being. Security Chief Special Order 392-5 All other entities modified by SCP-040 are to be disposed of after recovery and study, according to standard biological specimen clearance protocols, as outlined in document CDP-BIOEN-1. No outside organisms are to be brought into SCP-040's presence beyond those used in testing procedures. SCP-040 is to undergo daily school lessons and bi-weekly psychological review, overseen by Drs. Habernathy, Logan, and Izawa. Description SCP-040 is a Caucasian female of approximately 8 years of age, standing 1 meter in height. SCP-040 bears numerous physical abnormalities. The subject's skin is highly sensitive to light and easily damaged by physical contact, and the subject's hair is a bright pink in coloration. This hair is brittle and falls out easily. The subject displays green and yellow heterochromia, with the sclera of the left eye black in coloration. SCP-040 has no sight in this eye. SCP-040's emotional state is within acceptable boundaries for an individual of its age group, accounting for the effects of prolonged containment and physical abnormalities. Subject's intelligence is slightly above average for its age group, and displayed behavior is generally cooperative. Of note is SCP-040's quick acclimatization to containment, believed to be resultant of its upbringing before recovery. SCP-040 is capable of manipulating living matter, mutating and modifying existing organisms in order to create new ones, collectively referred to as SCP-040-1. This effect is at will, but requires significant focus and time to enact and becomes increasingly unreliable and inaccurate when manipulating details through small-scale modifications. SCP-040 is incapable of altering microscopic organisms, and has great difficulty in altering plant life. Dead organic matter may also be used, but must be used in conjunction with a living organism. Instances of SCP-040-1 will not demonstrate pre-modification behavior. The majority will act similar to domesticated house pets, generally with extreme loyalty to SCP-040, regardless of prior association. The appearance of SCP-040-1 instances will vary. Some instances will retain overall pre-modification form with some alteration, such as SCP-040's apparent modification to itself, though the majority will bear no resemblance to their original appearances. SCP-040 appears incapable of manipulating instances of SCP-040-1 more than once. Recovery Log Subject was recovered on 2000 in SCP-040 was one of 15 subjects taken into custody. Further investigation found no anomalous properties in any other individuals. Amnestics were administered to detainees and the general populace, and cover-up measures were enacted without further incident. Monitoring of the area is ongoing in order to detect any resurgence of Addendum 1 SCP-040 is currently allowed custody of the following SCP-040-1 instances. SCP-040-1A A polymorphic symbiotic organism capable of changing size, shape, color, and texture in reaction to its environment. Subject serves as outer clothing, similar to a jacket or sweater and absorbs nutrients from SCP-040's bloodstream. Subject was recovered alongside SCP-040, and genetic testing reveals that the subject shares the majority of its genetic makeup with the common house cat, Felis catus. SCP-040-1C 
a spherical organism capable of flight by means of rubbery bladders filled with helium. Entity has 11 limbs terminating in opposable digits and a complex respiratory system capable of replicating a wide variety of musical patterns. SCP-040-1J, a quadrupedal organism covered in a thick coat of pink and blue fur. Entity has no eyes, a broad mouth with blunt teeth, and is capable of climbing up vertical surfaces. Occasionally used by SCP-040 as a mode of transportation. Addendum 2. The following excerpt is from an interview carried out on 2000, three weeks after initial containment. Dr. Habernathy. Good morning, 40. SCP-040. Good morning, Miss Abernathy. Dr. Habernathy. It's good to see that you're getting over your cold. SCP-040. Mm-hmm. Dr. Habernathy. Can I ask you a few questions before we start with today's lesson? SCP-040. Yeah. Dr. Habernathy. Can you tell me about your parents? SCP-040. Mr. Green said that I don't have any. Dr. Habernathy. Can you tell me about Mr. Green then? SCP-040. He was nice, but he wasn't very good at talking. He would 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 always talk li like like this, but he wasn't there a lot of the time. Most of the time it was the nurses looking after us. Dr. Habernathy. And what did they do for you? SCP-040. They'd play games with us and teach us things, and sometimes they would make us wear these dumb helmets and sit quiet for a long time. Sometimes they'd put a movie on for us if we behaved, but if we were bad they would lock us in our rooms. Dr. Habernathy, can you tell me anything else? SCP-040, hmm. They always served us peas for dinner, and I hate peas, so I always gave mine to Five, because she liked peas, but I think green beans are better. Addendum 3, on 2000. SCP-040 successfully reanimated a deceased human body during testing, using three specimens of brown rat, Rattus norvegicus, as the required living component. Resultant subject retained no memories of previous life, and was judged to be of the approximate mental capacity of a human toddler. SCP-040 was highly distressed by the event, and refused further testing for the next three weeks. Item Number SCP-053 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-053 is to be contained in an area no less than 5 meters by 5 meters, 16 feet by 16 feet, and given adequate room to move. Toys, books, games, and other recreational devices are to be amply provided, and rotated every three months. Proper bedding, bathroom, and medical facilities are to be maintained at all times. Food should be provided three times daily, and two snacks are allowed if requested. No physical contact is to be made with SCP-053 without full atmosphere containment suit and eye shield. No eye contact is to be made with SCP-053 for any reason. Any objects given to personnel by SCP-053 may be removed, but must be given to quarantine for examination. Only one member of personnel may be present in the room at any given time and must be secured by a safety line of steel cable. All personnel must be removed from SCP-053's containment chamber within 10 minutes of entering. Any personnel who begin to act erratically, scream, or attempt to grab SCP-053 are to be removed and quarantined. Any personnel attempting to remove their suit are also to be removed and quarantined. No sharp objects or firearms are allowed in SCP-053's containment room. Description SCP-053 appears to be a small three-year-old girl. She is capable of basic speech and appears to be slightly above average in mental development. She has a generally pleasant personality and rarely seems upset, becoming agitated only in the presence of groups of people. Any and all humans over the age of three who make eye contact with, physically touch, or remain around SCP-053 for longer than ten minutes will rapidly become irrational, paranoid, and homicidal. Most, if not all, of these feelings will be directed at SCP-053, and afflicted subjects will attempt to kill SCP-053 after first killing or driving off all humans visible to them. 
Those attempting to kill SCP-053 will suffer massive heart attacks or seizures, and die seconds after doing any physical damage to SCP-053. SCP-053 will regenerate almost instantaneously from any wound, regardless of severity. SCP-053 appears wholly ignorant of these effects, and ignores any and all subjects affected. When questioned about the effect, SCP-053 is incapable of response. Item Number SCP-134 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-134 is currently contained within a specially outfitted humanoid containment cell, measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Since SCP-134 is completely blind, special safety precautions must be taken with the room's furnishings. SCP-134 is reasonably accustomed to the position of all objects in the cell, and navigates mostly from memory. SCP-134's room currently contains one single bed with additional mattress padding, one pink bed set including sheets, comforter, and pillow with Hello Kitty mascot print. Note, though blind, SCP-134 is able to feel the printed pattern and prefers it. One wardrobe and one chest of drawers, containing clothes and youth extra small. All drawers are to be labeled in braille and raised print English. One dollhouse with dolls and interior furnishings. Eight stuffed animals, three cats, two dogs, a giraffe, a dolphin, and a panda. A selection of children's literature in braille. One chair and one table. A craft station with modeling clay and building blocks. SCP-134 may request additional items, all of which must be approved by a staff member with level 3 clearance or higher. If any items are added to the room, SCP-134's handlers must be informed ahead of time to prepare her for the addition of something new to the environment. SCP-134 is to be tutored on a regular basis, both in general education appropriate for the subject's age and in braille. Description: SCP-134 seems to be an Asian girl, between the ages of and with short black hair and a slight build. The subject seems normal in most respects, and has all the biological requirements of a human child, food, sleep, etc. However, where SCP-134's eyes should be are two black pits, covered by a transparent membrane, similar in appearance to a human eye's membrane. Ophthalmological testing has shown that the membranes are between 150 and 200 times more resilient than those of a normal, non-anomalous human. SCP-134 lacks eyelids, and thus does not blink nor can SCP-134 see anything through these black areas. Attempts to examine the back of SCP-134's eyeball have failed, as no retina can be seen. In normal lighting conditions, they appear completely black, but in darkness, very faint lights have been seen within them. Further study with long exposure photography and light amplification revealed that the lights are actually stars and galaxies visible as though SCP-134's eye sockets are somehow looking out into deep space. To date, no astronomical formations have been recognized, though research by staff astronomer Dr. is ongoing. Sonar examination has revealed no unusual cavities within SCP-134's skull. However, data expunged, confirming the presence of data expunged, eye sockets being the local termini and intergalactic space between the remote termini. Parallax measurements indicate that the remote termini are between 20 and 2,000 meters apart, and are moving at between 20 and 40 times the speed of light. This does not appear to be linked to SCP-134's position, movement, or metabolism. Spectrographic analysis indicates that the remote termini periodically data expunged new location. The cause of this is not yet known. The shortest interval measured between shifts was six days while the longest was five weeks. As of yet, no termini shifts have been observed in progress. SCP-134 has not shown any hostile behavior, and seems unaware of any unnatural condition. SCP-134 shows behavioral symptoms similar to those seen in high-functioning autistic children, including patterned behavior and resistance to change. As such, SCP-134 has been assigned a childhood development specialist to help work with these issues. The specialist has suggested that proper childhood development requires a personal name, and has nicknamed SCP-134 Stella. 
SCP-134 has learned to associate being referred to by her SCP number with being subjected to physical tests, and becomes upset and less cooperative when this is done by individuals who have previously referred to her as Stella. Consequently, personnel are urged to not refer to her by name unless they wish their interactions with SCP-134 to be limited to interview sessions. The specialist has since been terminated from employment for taking too close an interest in the SCPs assigned to him. Any staff found referring to SCP-134 as Stella will be severely reprimanded. When questioned about her eyes, SCP-134 claims no knowledge of any deformation, even when allowed to feel normal human eyes for comparison. SCP-134 has to date volunteered no information about parentage or identity, though when acquired by the Foundation, SCP-134 was called Data Expunged. SCP-134 has proven docile and cooperative, and as such, staff should display all the normal courtesy they would to any other guest. SCP-134 was taken into Foundation custody based on reports of a deformed child, left at an undisclosed orphanage in Yokohama, Japan. SCP-134 has been in Foundation custody since 2000 at which time orphanage staff claimed SCP-134 was years old. Since then, SCP-134 has learned conversational English, in addition to the Japanese already known, and has demonstrated facility with Braille, though instruction is ongoing. Item number SCP-116 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-116 is kept in a 16 by 16 meter cell, constructed of Kevlar, with one meter of porous rubber padding on all surfaces. No personnel are to enter cell without proper briefing and threat reduction measures. Cell is to be monitored at all times by six agents, four stationed at corner points of cell and two stationed with SCP-116. No pointed objects or intrusive testing equipment of any kind are to be placed in the possession of the agents within the cell. Outside monitoring is achieved using VBS-05 class concealed button cameras, stationed at high corners in the cell. Outside monitoring is to be carried out by a further two agents. If suspicious activity begins, initialize Achilles Procedure Delta. All monitoring agents, internal or external, are to undergo bi-monthly IQ tests, as well as standard weekly psychiatric analysis. Significant drops in the IQ of agents, greater than or equal to 5 points, is to be regarded as prolonged exposure, and to be treated as outlined in standard quarantine instructions. Description: SCP-116 has the outward appearance of a Caucasian male, of around 9 years of age. Skin is cauterized and scarred, over 98% of body, limbs, and head. SCP-116's bone structure is drastically different from standard Homo sapiens bone layout, and all bones are dangerously brittle. The most distinguishing difference between the human body and that of SCP-116 is the non-existence of joints in the latter. SCP-116 is entirely capable of independent movement, but to do so would cause multiple shattering breaks to all bones affected by said movement. To combat this, SCP-116 shows remarkable self-healing, and over a period of minutes can completely regenerate its rigid bone placement. SCP-116 has shown some language skills since acquisition. However, the only language it speaks is a disrupted and broken version of English, in which every word has been replaced with an almost entirely unconnected one. Prolonged attempts to make sense of SCP-116's speech have resulted in some long-term mental degradation in researchers. There seems to be no pattern to the word replacement, and attempts continue to translate it. Research suggests that SCP-116 may be capable of low-level telepathy, which deteriorates the victim's brain functions over a long period of time. Appendix 1 Sergeant 19-0529 Memorandum May 29th Subject Development of Suicidal Tendencies by SCP-116 NB SCP-116 has begun to show extreme suicidal tendencies. Request modification of monitoring and containment protocol to avoid undue damage to subject. Appendix 2 Dr. 19-1429 SCP-116 Language Notes June 19th 116's unique linguistic setup is one of increasing interest to me. Continuing research by my team and me has yielded these somewhat basic results. 
No clear reasoning has been found as to why 116 communicates in this way. Although the words spoken by it are English, the parameters under which they operate are drastically different. No attempt has yet been made to produce written language from SCP-116 due to bone structure anomalies. Even speaking can be an extreme challenge for 116, despite its experienced dulled pain receptors. I have taken a special interest in this subject, as the way in which it reacts to normal English is remarkable. It is obvious that what we say to it sounds just as garbled to it as what it says back to us does to us, if that makes any sense at all. In all my years at Site-19, I have never seen anything quite like it linguistically. I will continue to study and record what I find. Appendix 3, Lieutenant 19-0349, Memorandum, June 30th. Subject, Procedure of and relating to worrying new suicidal tendencies shown by SCP-116. 1. No solid equipment weighing more than 8 pounds may be taken into cell. 2. All interior guards are to have canine teeth filed until blunted completely. 3. Security level is to be raised to RT5. Full body cavity search and x-ray before entrance to cell is granted. 4. If any asphyxiation or hypoxia appears to be affecting SCP-116, emergency CPR is to be administered by internal guards. Suggestion noted that SCP-116 should be connected to a life support machine even when not in danger of death, to prevent unintentional termination. Appendix 4, Sergeant 19-0529, Memorandum, July 11th. Subject, Cessation of Research Regarding SCP-116. Any and all research regarding SCP-116 is to be immediately halted until further notice. Dr. The primary researcher into SCP-116's language and delayed telepathy is to be removed from this site and kept in solitary confinement until all symptoms of his dementia and schizophrenia have dissipated. All personnel involved with SCP-116 are to be quarantined until further notice. Full bone marrow transplants are to be performed on all agents who have been in tactile contact with SCP-116. Suggested termination of interior guard protocol noted. Appendix 5, Colonel 20-0212, Memorandum. March 20th. Subject. Cessation of SCP-116 Project. Given the suicidal tendencies of SCP-116, its deleterious effects on involved personnel and lack of significant useful progress in research, I propose we allow SCP-116 to self-terminate in a controlled environment. This thing has, so far, proven to be a fruitless waste of resources. Perhaps post-mortem examination will provide us with answers we haven't been able to obtain so far. Welcome to SCP Orientation. Your training is about to begin. Today, we will be studying item number SCP-166, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-166 is contained in Biocontainment Zone C at Site-19 which has been modified to include a hermetically sealed antechamber and an industrial strength air purifier. Containment staff must wear the specially designated 166 biohazard suits at all times when inside SCP-166's containment area. Due to SCP-166's unique physiological needs, a variety of loose-fitting organic cotton clothing has been provided to be rotated monthly. All meals are to be cooked according to the guidelines provided, with as little inorganic additives as possible. Reasonable requests for personal items and modifications to the containment suite may be granted upon approval by a level 4 or higher authority. Update: All requests by SCP-166 must be approved personally by Site Director Light. To date, SCP-166 has requested a copy of the Holy Bible, Douay Rames, Chaloner Revision, granted. A Catholic Rosary, granted. Access to a Catholic priest for confession, mass, and other sacraments. Chaplain Davis has been scheduled to meet with SCP-166 on alternating Sundays after a thorough decontamination process. Various books and magazines, mostly religious in nature, granted. 
pending review and approval of contents. A telephone with which to contact the Abbess of the Our Lady of Mercy Convent in County Galway, Ireland. Denied by Site Director. Description SCP-166 is a European female human in its late teens with ungulate features, possessing antlers, hooved feet, and a short tail reminiscent of Rangifer Tarandis, common reindeer. Despite these obvious abnormalities, DNA analysis reveals no abnormal genetic traits. Within a 15-meter radius of SCP-166, artificial objects gradually return to an unworked state. Higher complexity objects like electronics or vehicles are affected quicker, with degradation of their metallic components causing catastrophic structural failure in a matter of hours. Rudimentary materials, such as stone buildings or products made of organic materials, decay at a virtually imperceptible rate. Within the same radius, plant life will begin to sprout, often growing in improbable places, such as out of security cameras or ID scanners. SCP-166 possesses a possibly anomalous sensitivity to artificial material and pollutants, with inhalation or contact causing pressure ulcers and symptoms of acute asthma attacks. In one case, physical proximity to a smoker caused SCP-166 to undergo a severe asthma attack, even though the doctor at the time had not smoked a cigarette for three weeks. Discovery SCP-166 was discovered at the Our Lady of Mercy convent in County Galway, Ireland, where it had lived since infancy. SCP-166 was confirmed by a defecting Global Occult Coalition agent to be the child of threat entity 9927 Black, the goddess also known as SCP, who was terminated by a GOC strike team in what would be known as the Cornwall Incident. Recovered GOC Documentation Threat ID KTE-9927-Blackchild The Daughter Authorized Response Level 4. Severe Threat Description Threat Entity is the child of incarnated LTE-9927 Black, the goddess, and an unknown father. While it strongly resembles its mother and shares its animalistic features, it lacks the extreme bestial appearance of 9927 Black, possesses minor chlorokinetic abilities, but primary reason for Threat Entity classification is the instinctive knowledge and eligibility to enact Occult Procedure Clockwork Black Child Havala, a worldwide ritual working that would irreversibly regress human civilization to Neolithic standards. Strike Team Lancelot neutralized 9927 Black in 19... in England, during an operation which would later be known as the infamous Cornwall Incident, but were unable to confirm the liquidation of 9927 Black Child due to the death of the strike leader, Agent Ukulele. Ukulele was posthumously awarded the Silver Aegis for his lifelong service to humanity. Liquidation Threat Entity is not known to possess any defensive abilities. Terminate with extreme prejudice. The agent had refused to terminate SCP-166, instead smuggling it to a Catholic convent in County Galway, Ireland. It lived there until the age of 12, at which point, a visitor to the convent accidentally witnessed SCP-166 and reported it to authorities. The agent then contacted the Foundation, agreeing to share GOC intelligence in return for the guaranteed safety and containment of SCP-166. Further details are classified. Addendum 166.1 Chaplain Davis Bi-Weekly Interview Davis. Good morning, child. SCP-166. Good morning, father. Davis. As usual, I have to remind you that due to our environment, the seal of confession will not take place unless specifically invoked. Even then, details of our conversation can be unsealed if they're determined to be essential. Understand? SCP-166 nods. Davis. Excellent. Now. How are you doing? SCP-166 Good. One of the staff told me about Benedict yesterday. Is that true? 
Davis. Ah, yes, that was rather unfortunate, but it does make sense. He was rather old even when he first took up the position. Now he can rest, knowing he served the church well. SCP-166 Do you know who's going to replace him? Davis Speculation has abounded, but it could be anyone. These are difficult times after all, with all the recent… controversies. They may want a fresh face to represent the church, or they may go with a man who's dedicated years of his life. Who knows, they may even pick a working class man. It certainly would give people something to talk about. SCP-166 I guess so. SCP-166 and Davis fall silent. Davis I'm sensing a question arising, child. SCP-166 Sorry. Davis No need to apologize. That is what I'm here for, after all. What is it? SCP-166 It's just… I wanted to ask you something, though it might be a little personal. I was just wondering, do you have a good relationship with your parents? Davis My mother, yes. Before she passed away, I visited her once a month at their retirement home, plus her birthday and holidays. Told her I was a chaplain serving in the military, which I suppose is somewhat close to the truth. SCP-166 And your father? Davis That is a rather more complicated question. He was a good man, a soldier, who held three things dearly. God, country, and family. Unfortunately, he held those convictions rather severely which resulted in some… heated discussions. I love him still, but this way is best for everyone. Davis sighs. Davis, and what about your parents? I know you lived in the convent, but before that? SCP-166 I never really knew them. I got dropped off when I was a baby. I mean, I guess they must have known the sisters if they put me there, but I don't remember them. Just what I picked up. They mentioned my mother a bit before they realized that they should watch what they say about me. I think they said something about her being a goddess? Which obviously wouldn't be true, she must have been some sort of spirit, but she must have been something if I ended up looking like this. SCP-166 gestures to herself. SCP-166 I remember eavesdropping on the Abyss. She was talking to one of the other sisters about how she had done something wrong, something about a ritual that someone else stopped. They said she died. Davis, I'm sorry for your loss. SCP-166, not like I knew her. Davis, and your father. SCP-166 hesitates. SCP-166, I don't know. He must have been the one who dropped me off at the convent, but why there? Why didn't he take me with him? Davis, I'm sure he had his reasons. SCP-166, maybe. You know, they never talked about him. Not once. I must have asked the Abyss a thousand times, but she never even mentioned a hint of him. SCP-166 pauses. SCP-166 If my mother was so horrible, what did my father do? End log. Addendum 166.2 Disciplinary interview of expunged. Begin log. Light. What the hell were you thinking? Expunged. I wanted to make sure she's alright. You wouldn't let me talk to her. I took another route. Light. What you did was so much worse than that. If you just stuck to throwing your weight around to get her amenities, sure, I could overlook that. But you then go about trying to give a Class 4 anomaly a phone line to the outside world. Damn it. The Council already dislikes you working at the same site as her. This gets out, you can kiss whatever deal you made goodbye. Expunged. Come on, Sophia. She's harmless. The only reason she's in there is because of me. I had to do something. Was the Foundation just going to let her grow up thinking that her- Light. Before you say another word, remember that this will be public to everyone with a Class 4 clearance. I can redact your name, but I can't stop people from putting the pieces together from an ill-timed outburst. Expunged remains silent. Expunged. Sixteen years. 
16 years where she couldn't walk through a city, or catch a movie, or just go shopping. Doesn't matter if she's in a convent or a foundation cell, she's being locked up for something she had no choice in. All because of me. It isn't fair. Light. I know. Expunged. And I can't do anything about it. I could send a strike team anywhere in the world. I know secrets that the most powerful people in the world would pay billions for. And yet I can't even so much as talk to her. Let her know that she's not alone. Light. You've done the best you could. Much more than anyone could have expected of you in an impossible situation. Expunged. Funny how little that makes of a difference. I... Expunged falls silent. Expunged. You know, I don't care. Just write me up. Let's just get this over with. Light. I'm scheduling you for six two-hour sessions with a Foundation psychologist. I'll make sure it's glass. He signs off at the end of it. We can expunge this from your record. I know. Thank you, Sophia. End log. On 05-08-2013, the following note was discovered within SCP-166's containment area. I first met your mother when we were little more than children. She had hooves for feet and starlight in her eyes. She was beauty and nature incarnate, and I killed her with my own two hands. Eden isn't a place. It's a state of being. They wanted to take us back to it, and I stopped them. I took paradise away from us for a second time. I have never regretted my actions on that day, except one. That when you first met me on that day, you saw your father put a bullet into the head of your mother. I make no excuses, only explanation. You may not have even remembered it, but I'm telling you now in the hope you understand why I did what I did. I hope you forgive me. I love you. I wish I could have done more for you. The best I could do was leave you in the hands of kind and loving people and hope they would raise you in my place. From what I've seen, they did well. I'm sorry you couldn't stay with them. I'm sorry they've brought you to this place. I promise to do my best to make sure your stay here is pleasant. I promise to keep you safe. Happy 16th birthday. From your loving father. Item number. SCP-191. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-191 is currently housed in a 6 meter by 6 meter room at Site 17. To date, SCP-191 has not made any requests for furnishings or entertainment. Current furnishings include one wooden frame futon with a 15 centimeter or 6 inch pad and standard cotton bed sheets and blankets. All sheets are to be sterilized each morning according to standard procedures. The futon pad itself will be replaced every six months, and the old pad discarded through incineration. One standard 220 volt Type G power outlet with an emergency cutoff box, fuse, circuit breaker, and manual non insulating guillotine located outside the cell. One standard hazardous waste disposal unit, liquid and solid waste. All drainage tubes shall lead directly to an incinerator unit. SCP-191 is to be dressed in loose, sleeveless garments, made of 100% long staple cotton. Fresh clothing will be provided once daily, with used garments sterilized according to standard procedures. Bathing is to be done once every evening, in a wash tub filled with a solution of water and baking soda. Feeding in the form of a sterile saline solution supplemented with vitamins, minerals, antibiotics, and a mild anesthetic, shall be carried out twice a day via injection into a metallic tube located in the base of the neck. SCP-191 is capable of limited self-care, including draining waste and recharging internal batteries. A log shall be kept of power consumption and any unusual changes in power usage reported to supervising staff. Daily inspections for injury should be carried out after bathing. Should SCP-191 require medical care, refer to Documents 191 Alpha, Special Medical Needs, and 191 Alpha Supplemental, Repair of Non-Biological Components, before administering care. At least two armed guards are to be present in the room any time that personnel have contact with SCP-191, 
although a translucent screen may be utilized for privacy purposes. Standard anti-computer countermeasures are ineffective, as SCP-191's components have been hardened against electromagnetic pulse (EMP). Description: SCP-191 is a female human child, approximately years old. It is believed to have been a test subject of several experimental surgeries performed by the late Dr. R 1. 80% of the left half of the face and skull have been removed, with the eye and ear replaced by a complex transceiver system that allows it to receive and transmit not only visual and auditory input, but a wider spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, ranging from low-frequency radio to high-energy gamma rays. The lower jaw, teeth, and larynx have been removed and replaced with data expunged. The esophagus has been rerouted to an artificial orifice at the back of the neck, feeding tube, and the trachea rerouted directly to an air filtration device. Due to these alterations, SCP-191 is incapable of speech, although it has been reported occasionally vocalizing distress through rapid respiration. 2. An input-output device has been placed into the right forearm, replacing the radius and ulna bones. The device contains interfaces for a variety of modern and obsolete formats, including USB, Ethernet, Firewire, and DIN-8 PIN, as well as seven other interfaces corresponding to no-known formats. The device can be accessed by pulling back the skin over the right arm, like a shirt sleeve. 3. A 24-core processor array has been implanted in the brain, which translates input from all artificial components essentially allowing SCP-191 to read and write computer data without the use of an external interface. Internal communication is carried out through fiber-optic cables, implanted through the glial cells and the entire nervous system. Damage to the brain stem and cerebellum due to the implantation procedure has severely damaged SCP-191's motor skills. 4. The right hand and right foreleg have been replaced with artificial components consisting primarily of steel, carbon fiber, and an unknown polymer-like substance. The exposed areas of tissue are susceptible to injury and infection. Due to damage to the spinothalamic tract, SCP-191 has reduced pain and temperature sensitivity in its limbs. Reconstructive surgery by Dr. was able to provide some relief, but regular doses of antibiotics and analgesics are still required. 5. The lungs, heart, and major blood vessels have been replaced with mechanical analogs. It has been determined that this system would allow SCP-191's bodily systems to be restarted after death. 6. The digestive system has been completely reconfigured, to the point where regular food intake is both unnecessary and dangerous. Waste is now disposed of via a drainage system, located in the lower back and consists of a thick, dark gray, viscous slime. 7. The reproductive organs, uterus, ovaries, etc., have been removed and replaced with data expunged. According to R's notes, this was done to provide extra space by removing non-vital components. Hormone therapy has been proposed to counteract the long-term effects of the missing glands. This proposal is under review, pending analysis of possible complications. 8. At least 15 other alterations of unknown purpose. Given this fact, and the haphazard integration of the useful components, it is believed that they were performed merely to test the viability of such procedures on other subjects. Investigations are underway as to whether Dr. was planning to data expunged. At present, any theories as to the purpose behind these alterations are speculative at best, as said doctor died during the raid in which SCP-191 was recovered. See notes below, and the only surviving records of his research are a single half-burned spiral-bound notebook consisting mostly of cryptic notes regarding a higher purpose. History SCP-191 was recovered by Foundation agents during a brief collaborative effort with the Global Occult Coalition, in which a raid was conducted on the laboratory of Dr. a suspected member of SCP-191 was the only test subject recovered from the laboratory. 
All other test subjects expired during the raid, either disposed of by said doctor or eliminated as hostiles by the task force. Preliminary assessment concluded that full reconstruction was impossible, that the components introduced were too technologically advanced to risk becoming widely known, and that it could be a source of valuable data if kept alive. Subject was classified SCP-191 and was moved to site its disappearance, and those of the other test subjects, was later blamed on a local serial killer who was arranged to be killed in prison while awaiting trial. Addendum 191-01 Testing of SCP-191's abilities has commenced. Experiment Log 191 Note. This is a test log for exploring the capabilities of SCP-191. Please remember that SCP-191 is a research tool, not an entertainment center. Any test involving games or other recreational technology should be conducted in a professional manner and not for amusement. Dr. Subject. Paint. A ubiquitous, simple drawing program. Instructions. Interface with a computer via USB port and draw specified pictures using paint. Results. SCP-191 was instantly able to emulate the functions of a mouse and keyboard. When showed any photograph, 191 was able to reproduce it within seconds using only the pencil tool, creating copies indistinguishable from the original. After the test was recorded, it was noticed that SCP-191 had continued drawing in additional paint files. SCP-191 appeared surprised and opened a text file on screen, claiming that it had not realized it was still drawing. The following drawings were discovered. Three people wearing what appeared to be GOC uniforms, standing in a burning office, pointing guns at a man across the room. The man is committing suicide via gunshot wound to the head, his face obscured by blood. An adult and child trick-or-treating. The child is a girl wearing makeup similar to that worn by Boris Karloff in Frankenstein. SCP-191 was once again asked if it was really feeling well, and once again replied, via text file, that it was fine and that the expunged didn't mean anything. Subject: Undisclosed Video Game Instructions Attempt to emulate the functions of a Wiimote and play a video game. Result Test began poorly, as SCP-191's impaired motor skills caused it to snap the disc in two before it could place it in the console. SCP-191 became distressed. It then stared at the disc, and the red light from its eye changed to green for a moment. When Dr. returned with a fresh disc, less than two minutes had passed. The game was already running on the machine. Said doctor inquired as to how that happened and a message appeared on the screen saying, I looked at the ones and the zeros, and I loaded those in. I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to do it this way, but I didn't want you to waste a disc. Please don't be angry. SCP-191 still seemed fearful of reprimand, even after being reassured that it was doing excellently. SCP-191 made a perfect run-through of the game, despite the fact that it did not make any physical movements consistent with the Wii controls. Subject a well-known video effects program, a 40-second video file from a security camera located in the employee cafeteria. Instructions Perform a series of video enhancement techniques used by forensic detectives on the popular television drama <laughs> techniques that cannot actually be done in reality. Zoom and Enhance SCP-191 was instructed to zoom in on the window over the parking lot and render the license plates on the cars which were illegible from this distance. The actual license plates had been photographed for reference. Uncrop SCP-191 was asked to shrink the video by 100 pixels on every side and fill in the blank space with what it believed the rest of the cafeteria looked like. Again, data that was not actually available in the video. Rotate Camera SCP-191 was informed of the exact location and angle of the other security camera in the cafeteria and asked to render the scene as viewed from that angle, filling in the parts that the camera did not see. The actual footage from the second camera was requisitioned and held for reference. Result: SCP-191 could not understand the instructions at first, 
Dr. Rand had to provide a lengthy explanation and then stand behind SCP-191 and give it instructions one step at a time. It was several minutes before the test could even begin. However, once SCP-191 actually got started, the videos and frames were finished in less than seven minutes, of which at least three were spent watching the rendering progress bar. Zoom and Enhance Test SCP-191 successfully rendered close-ups of the license plates, complete with photorealistic scratches and dents. However, the plates were found not to match the license plates on the vehicles. SCP-191 typed, the data wasn't there, so I had to guess. Uncrop Test SCP-191 expanded the video canvas and filled in what was in the blank space, rendering the extra image seamlessly. It did not match the actual cafeteria, but once again, the data was not in the video file and SCP-191 had been forced to guess. Rotate Camera Test The generated video matched the angle of the second camera perfectly, and almost everything visible from the angle of camera 1 matched the scene in camera 2 very closely. As before, places not visible were very different. One table only visible in camera 2 that had been seating was now, in the generated video, seating the attending doctor and agent supervising SCP-191, eating lunch and talking. Although there were many visual differences between the original videos and SCP-191's copies, many on-site personnel were unable to determine which ones were the forgeries. End Log Psychological Analysis by Dr. Glass SCP-191 has responded fairly well to containment. It is completely docile and cooperative, and when not being interacted with, it spends most of its time sitting still or curled up in a fetal position. This may be a sign of distress, but it is more likely for physical comfort, as normal body movements and postures are difficult. Mental acuity is questionable. Although capable of rapid data analysis and communications when physically linked to a computer system, it seems unable to follow conversations with human beings, unless the conversant speaks slowly and uses simple words. Complex tasks are also impossible, unless it is guided at every step. Its mood seems consistent, though somewhat inscrutable. It continually affects melancholy, will not make eye contact unless asked to, and any attempts to induce a cheerful or humorous mood have proven fruitless. However, it shows no signs of ongoing mental distress and claims, through computer interface, that it is feeling well. To date, SCP-191 has not requested access to or information about any acquaintance it had before its abduction. Item Number SCP-097 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-097 is contained within the limits of the property where it was initially discovered, Zone SCP-097. The property is surrounded by an 8-meter tall concrete block fence, fitted with barbed wire and security camera systems. Satellite images of Zone SCP-097 are to be doctored, removing all traces of the area. Any and all new plant growth outside the containment area suspected to originate from within the SCP is to be sterilized through application of boiling salt water and or incinerated. Absolutely all abnormal behavior is to be reported to Dr. Bridge within 10 minutes of occurrence. If any personnel or their families experience hallucinations or thematically related dreams outside of containment, they are to contact Dr. Bridge to schedule treatment. Localities surrounding SCP-097, specifically are to be monitored from the 1st of April until the 1st of November every year for affected civilians. Medical establishments dealing with sleep abnormalities are to be monitored for signs of SCP-097's influence. Civilians below the age of 16 encountered alone within one square kilometer of Zone SCP-097 are to be taken into Foundation custody and are to be treated with a Class B amnestic and returned home, or the nearest police station. Personnel tasked with the return of civilians are to avoid public exposure. Each agent is to be assigned a cover story to follow if they do encounter civilians en route to their destinations. The morning after the first frost of the year, a team of 25 agents armed with agricultural tools are to enter SCP-097 and clear away the outer plant matter. This process is not to continue past dusk. Description 
SCP-097 is a 10-acre area of land in the state of in the Midwestern United States. It is the abandoned remains of the County Fair 1969, an area of approximately 2.3 kilometers squared, or approximately 5.4 square miles. Structures within the SCP area exist in a state of moderate disrepair, consistent with the expected age and environment. At the center of SCP-097 lie the remains of a 1956 GMC pickup truck, the majority of which is crushed beneath a colossal pumpkin of unknown subtype. Henceforth, SCP-097-1. SCP-097-1 stands approximately 7.4 meters or 24.3 feet tall, and 8.1 meters or 26.8 feet in diameter at its widest. Current estimates put SCP-097-1 at approximately 15,000 kilograms, or approximately 33,070 pounds. This pumpkin remains roughly spherical in shape, instead of spreading out under its own weight as would be expected of a plant of its size. The remaining portion of SCP-097, approximately 2 kilometers squared, is overgrown with several dozen varieties of pumpkins, with over 70 subspecies yet identified and many previously unknown to agriculture. Many of these pumpkins have been shown capable of growing to enormous sizes, the average estimated weight being around 250 kilograms, average 550 pounds. These pumpkins, along with the other assorted crops, grow with, on, and around the remains of the 1969 fairgrounds, creating a maze-like arrangement of plant life. The average height of the walls within SCP-097 is 1.6 meters though this may vary from year to year. Between April and November each year, the area within SCP-097 has produced a number of anomalous phenomena, ranging from benign to implicitly aggressive. To date, 17 agents have been severely maimed within SCP-097, 8 having died. Event Log SCP-097 This is a general incident log for SCP-097 for the cycle between September 1st in November 1st, this is an abridged version. Please requisition full individual reports from Dr. Bridge. During this time, four civilian children were captured and returned to their families. Event 1. Cameras 3B, 4A, 4C, 5B view child, approximately four years of age, walk between tangles of plant matter towards SCP-0971 over an eight-minute period. Child appeared to be dragging a stuffed animal. Notes. Child appeared on footage during review period. No figure was viewed at the time of recording. Event 2. Human scream heard from within SCP-097, heard throughout the site. On-site personnel described it as possessing a small child's voice, sustained for approximately three minutes before stopping abruptly. Notes. Staff reported feeling as if they were being watched during the event. Event 3. Several bedsheet ghosts are seen throughout various security feeds throughout the day, would only appear for approximately one to three seconds before vanishing again. Staff did not report seeing any anomalous entities firsthand. Notes. Patrols doubled for the remaining time in the SCP's cycle. Event 4. Unidentifiable singing is heard throughout the site, persisting for three hours before becoming silent. Recordings reveal song-like gibberish, with up to 30 individual children's voices singing at any time. Notes. Recordings archived for future study. Event 5. Agent McRoy cuts a pumpkin's vine with machete. Severed vine proceeds to bleed approximately 50 liters of human blood before shriveling. Notes. Blood type AB negative. No DNA match. Event 6. Overnight. Two separate pumpkin patches grew into the rough approximations of human figures, lying on the ground. Notes. Destroyed without incident. Event 7. Agent Long found decapitated, neck against a pumpkin. Notes. Disappeared en route to a restroom break. Event 8. All light bulbs on site burn out within a two minute period. Notes. Critical areas repaired before nightfall. Event 9. Sudden shift noted in the location of several dozen gourd plants. Notes. Time and nature of actual event. Unknown. Event 10. Agent Cole accidentally damages and breaks pumpkin during weekly examination of SCP-097. Pumpkin splits open, 
revealing a complete human child's skeleton in the fetal position within. Notes. Female approximately five years old. No DNA match. Event 11. 29 freshly decapitated crows. Corvus Bracarinkos. Found outside SCP-097's containment wall. Notes. None. Event 12. Matured pumpkin plant found to have replaced a potted plant growing inside Dr. Bridges' office. Notes. Indoor plants banned from the site. Pumpkin incinerated immediately. Event 13. Agent Matthews falls unconscious during patrol and cannot be awoken until removed from property. Notes. Agent reported dreaming of autumn colors and the smell of leaves. Full recovery. Reassigned to desk work pending examination. Event 14. Research assistant Sturm reports overwhelming taste and scent of pumpkin permeating her senses. No other personnel report anomaly. Notes. Transferred off-site. Examination pending. Event 15. Sounds of steady drums play throughout the day, from 00 to 2359. Notes. Source of sound unknown. Recordings archived for future study. Event 16. Male child, approximately six years of age and clad in pajamas, seen climbing through corn stalks on the eastern end of SCP-097, moving towards SCP-0971. Notes. Lost to SCP-0971. How the child was able to escape notice by personnel until after he was lost to the SCP is unknown. Event 17. All personnel within 3.6 kilometers of SCP-0971 report hallucinations of orange haze and children's laughter. Notes. Personnel evacuated to a distance outside the area of effect. Personnel screened for mental interference. Event 18. All power and backup power to the area failed. Upon recovery, a number of pumpkins within SCP-097 were found to have changed into carved lanterns. Notes. It is unknown how SCP-097 generated and lit candles. Team 097 Alpha and Beta tasked to destroy lanterns after sunrise. Event 19. Team 097 Alpha reports seeing and hearing children playing among the flora within SCP-097. Recordings lack the entities expected from the reports. Notes. Children noted to be clad in pajamas. Teams pulled from SCP. Screened for mental interference. Event 20. Zaya Mays and Dorada kernels fall from the sky around SCP-097. Does not fall within containment walls. Notes. Area cleansed with flame units and replanted with non-native grasses. Pavement of outside area pending. Event 21. Research assistant O'Toole overcome with nausea and vomits pumpkin seeds. O'Toole did not eat pumpkin seeds previous to vomiting. Notes. Research assistant O'Toole transferred to site for examination. Seeds incinerated with prejudice. Event 22. Research assistant O'Toole reported to have died overnight. Autopsy reveals thoracic cavity was filled with pumpkin seeds. Notes. Body incinerated at site. All personnel scheduled for full physical examination. Event 23. Unintelligible whispering gibberish heard by fertile female personnel throughout the area when in view of SCP-097. Phenomenon continues throughout the day, continuing for the duration of SCP-097 cycle, i.e. until November 1st. Notes. Associated personnel removed from duty and scheduled for examination. Event 24. Headlights of vehicle underneath SCP-0971 light and stay lit until daybreak. Notes. None. Event 25. Fruit trees within SCP-097 blossom over the course of five hours, beginning at roughly 700 hours. Flowers wither and fall soon after. Notes. None. Event 26. Pumpkins near south entrance to SCP-097 began spontaneously bleeding from the stem. Each continued bleeding for three hours. Notes. Blood type AB negative. No DNA match. Event 27. Several dozen unidentified spheres of red light viewed drifting above SCP-097 and surrounding area. When light was shown directly on the spheres, a piercing shriek was heard. 
Notes. Personnel called into the main building until the spheres dissipated at dawn. Event 28. Sounds of steady drums are recorded from within SCP-097. Drums persist for the following 12 hours. Notes. No source identified. Recordings archived for future study. Event 29. All strawberry plants within SCP-097 wither in unison. Notes. None. Event 30. Between 25 and 30 animate human skeletons of varying size are recorded breaking out of larger pumpkins within SCP-097. Skeletons traverse through SCP-097's flora to the northeast peach tree and hang themselves from its branches using lengths of grapevine, electrical cable, and decaying rope. Skeletons ceased anomalous behavior after pantomiming death by hanging. Death throes continued for approximately 23 minutes. Notes. Skeletons recovered after first frost. All appeared under 12 years of age. No DNA matches. Skeletons incinerated after examination. Addendum. Historical note. Prior to the construction of SCP-097's containment wall, instances of what are now known as SCP-21711 were occasionally observed to form fragmented walls, and at one point a near-complete ring of 2171 around SCP-097's area of effect. This behavior ceased following the containment wall's completion. The purpose and implications behind this interaction are as of yet unknown. Effects of SCP-097 on Children In addition to its immediate effects outlined in Event Log SCP-097, SCP-097-1 appears to produce an undetectable signal towards children in an undetermined range. For clarity, Children will refer to individuals up to the age of 10. Beginning in early April, civilian children within SCP-097's undefined range may be overcome with somnambulism on clear nights. Affected children will move around their homes, stopping to face closed doorways for several seconds before moving on to the next nearest doorway, eventually returning to bed. At first, this behavior will occur only once a week, beginning with only the doors on a single floor. This sleepwalking will become more frequent, by mid-August happening every night. If forcibly awoken at any time during these episodes, they will scream for several seconds, before succumbing to a degree of confusion. After an affected child is awoken in this manner, the effect will cease, and the child will never show any further signs of SCP-097's influence. Over the course of two to three months, these episodes will become more thorough. Affected individuals seeking out each doorway inside their home, as well as those on their household's property, such as garages, car doors, and fence gates. Eventually, they will begin visiting the front doors of neighbors. Beginning in September, affected children who have remained undisturbed during these episodes will begin to remain outside at sunrise, laying on grass near their homestead and returning to full REM sleep. Affected children may recall dreams centering around autumn activities. Between September 1st and November 1st, if the affected children have not been awoken during the preceding sleepwalking episodes, they will cease the previously established activity during the sleepwalk, and instead begin to walk directly towards SCP-097's location. They will travel over fields and down secondary roads, steadily moving towards SCP-097. Local geography consists mostly of undeveloped foundation-owned property, facilitating uninterrupted travel. Upon arrival at SCP-097, an affected child will sit down before SCP-097-1 and begin singing unidentifiable gibberish as music begins to play. While a number of instruments have been recorded, simple drums and pipes are the most consistently encountered. After several minutes, childlike entities will crawl out from tangled flora or break out of larger pumpkins within SCP-097. The children will be wearing whatever they were last seen with most often pajamas or similar clothing. Many of these entities match those children known to be lost to SCP-097-1. The entities will surround the affected civilian child, dancing and singing in a circle as SCP-097-1 begins to emit dim light. The affected child will awaken, normally expressing a great deal of terror. The instant any vocalization is produced, the entities will swarm and kill the child. Methods used are different in each instance, but usually involve dismemberment or strangulation. At this point, 
Any and all efforts to interrupt the entities will fail, whether through breakdown of equipment, sudden intangibility of the subjects, or express violence on the part of SCP-097. After the death of the affected child, SCP-0971 will split open and the entities will hurl the remains into it before climbing in themselves. SCP-0971 will then close and the music will stop. Before the containment wall was erected, at least children between the ages of 3 and 10 are known to have been lost to SCP-097. Item Number SCP-200 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-200 requires a temperate, secure environment, large enough to house the 1.68 by 2 meter bed frame it is affixed to. The room should be equipped with a large viewing window, such that SCP-200 may be observed with minimal disturbance. In fact, when not being directly tested, SCP-200 should be left undisturbed. Particular care should be taken when collecting samples to avoid compromising the delicate outer shell of SCP-200. An automated mister should be set up to apply a fine mist to SCP-200 once a day. If SCP-200 appears to be drying out, an additional mist can be applied, but care should be taken not to allow it to become too moist. Due to the uncertain nature of SCP-200, the door to its containment area should be kept locked at all times, and direct interaction is restricted to clearance level 2 staff as a precaution. Description SCP-200 is contained within a chrysalis, measuring 172.4 centimeters in length from stem to tip, attached to a standard queen-size bed frame and mattress. The chrysalis is a mottled brown in color, and analysis shows it to consist of several layers of silk, woven in such a way as to be coarse to the touch. The silk layers appear to be held together by data expunged. SCP-200 itself was last seen as a 13-year-old Caucasian male, measured at 152 centimeters in height and weighing 168.73 kilograms. It retreated into its chrysalis on date undisclosed and researchers have been unable to explain how the child produced the silk to construct its encasement. Ultrasound tests have been unable to detect any solids within the chrysalis. However, fluid samples extracted from within reveal human DNA, matching that of the child in question. It appears that the child has data expunged. Samples of the data expunged, used to bind the chrysalis, are also a DNA match for SCP-200. SCP-200 lies dormant a majority of the time, although it may be observed twitching occasionally, particularly if it is startled by sudden contact or a loud noise. However, in its current state, it poses no threat. Notes: SCP-200 was retrieved from USA in 2000, approximately 28 hours after Chrysalis presented. According to medical records, SCP-200 followed a normal pattern of human development until age 12. At this point, the child began to display a voracious appetite and rapidly gained weight over the course of the following year. A local pediatrician was unable to identify a cause for the abrupt change in metabolism. The child's mother, concerned about his weight gain, attempted to restrict his diet. SCP-200 escaped into the surrounding woods. When authorities located the boy 72 hours later, he had doubled his weight on a diet of data expunged. After being returned home, SCP-200 developed its chrysalis. Following retrieval, Class A amnestics were administered to the child's mother, the pediatrician, and local authorities. Local community was led to believe that data expunged to prevent concern about the boy's whereabouts and well-being. Addendum 200-01 According to the most recent testing, SCP-200's DNA has been displaying a number of mutations. While ultrasound tests still reveal no solids, Dr. hypothesizes that the child may be developing into data expunged. This hypothesis remains controversial and requires further testing and observation. In light of these developments, request to reclassify SCP-2000 under Euclid has been approved and 24-7 observation shifts are being implemented.
to watch for SCP-200's emergence. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.